Hello, my precious. Welcome to the weigh-in session number three with Nick Easterday, the drifting massage therapist. And if you've ever dreamed of living or traveling in a van and making a living using your hands, Nick is a man who is making that dream real. I met Nick inside Drift Mobile Massage Clinic, which is a gorgeous blue van. And we had a conversation from everything from gargling coconut oil, living homeless, to what it means to travel, what it means to be a minimalist. We dive into all sorts of topics. So sit back and let's weigh in. Thank you for having me in the in Drift Mobile in Drift. Massage Clinic. Yeah, yeah, no problem, man. Uh, so yeah, I don't know when when my fascination with being homeless started, if you will. <laughs> but I mean, growing up. My dad's a veterinarian, and I moved almost yearly because he was, you know, looking for the right practice to work out of. And then, I don't know, in college, I backpacked through Europe with just way too much stuff on in a backpack, hitchhiked all over slept on floors slept in parks climbed up painting building scaffolding and slept on the top of that had an amazing time and still came back finished up my fin my last year of college and then yeah a couple of years ago well i knew that i was going to move to seattle and i had been a massage therapist for four years at that point and you know always working in these really fancy spas you know I worked at a ski resort where you know, I bike down to the lake hop in my kayak kayak across the lake jog up to the spa you know put on my my attire and then massage all day and in the summer I'd wakeboard between clients go pick berries or hike the trails or mountain bike or something in the winter I'd snowboard between clients and you know drink my face off at the at the <laughs> the the resort spot or the lodge and you know sometimes I just pass out on a massage table in the spa because it was there and it was quite comfortable you know didn't risk driving home drunk and I kind of that's when the seed maybe got planted that God, if I just work in these beautiful places where I have a gym, I have a shower, you know, can get food, eat trail mix, whatever, easily enough, why do I need to be wasting money on rent? But, you know, then I started dating a girl and, you know, moved in with her and but then I moved out to Seattle. And I was like, oh, I should I should try that again. But, you know, fear held me back because especially in the quote unquote big city, it's like, oh, if you're living, if you're not in a house, you're not secure. But as as I lived in Seattle for a few years, I realized that I've lived in South Central L.A. I've been through some ghetto spots in Europe, Southeast Asia, all over the place. Seattle's fine. I don't have to worry about it. So I bought a camper shell, welded a bike rack uh, for my truck, and lived out of the back of my truck for two years. You know, I was dating girls at the time, so I'd, you know, take showers, cook food at their place. You know, I was working at spas, so... Like all my bases is recovered, saved tons of money, traveled a bunch, and I was really fortunate because my dog had to get surgery on both her knees. That was about eight grand, which had I been living in the shithole house that I had been living in, I would not have had that money. And but instead, I just paid out of pocket, cash in hand, for her to get fixed up and. And all this cash, this is all from being a masseuse? Yeah, your, I was their doing... Your main source of income at the time? Yeah, I was or... uh, mostly a massage therapist, 
and I think I cooked a couple days a week at a at a bar in Fremont, which again, you know, massive kitchen that was always clean because I was the the one working there as mm-hmm. opposed to the houses that I've lived in with roommates where I'm constantly cleaning up after people and slowly going insane mm-hmm. because it's just my fastidious nature. So yeah, then uh then I moved in with a buddy. It was January. I'd been <laughs> You know, camping out in the back of my truck and just, or no, I think I'd gone home for, for the holidays and I came back and I was like, yeah, crawling into the back of my truck, wet, I'm done with this. Moved in with my friend, uh, helping pay his mortgage. So I felt a little better about, you know, paying rent wasn't a total waste. I'm helping a buddy out. But, you know, like all good things, it came to an end and eventually he, you know, wanted to raise my rent a couple hundred bucks a month. And I'm like, eh, screw this. I'd been thinking about the mobile massage clinic idea for a while and, you know, saw all the tiny house videos and micro, micro studios in New York where they just took full advantage of the space and everything had multiple utility and it's like I could do that you know buy a box truck buy an RV something rip it out rip out the stuff and you know build my little space so this last uh, December I was gonna go back to Idaho to work it up in Sun Valley at a resort spa anyhow and I was like this is this is the time I I had been selling insurance for the last two years and you know 40 plus hours a week cold calling people click clacking away on a on a damn keyboard wearing a a a shirt and a noose I mean tie (laughs) and and just fucking hating it (laughs) Because I would just sit sit at my desk, and it was beautiful office on Capitol Hill, right across from Bauhaus, and I would just look outside and see the sunshine and the day, <laughs> like, escaping before me, and I was like, fuck this. <laughs> the ultimate torture, yeah. sitting in a cube with yep. the noose looking outside at the light and freedom so close and so far away. Yeah, and trust me, it wasn't it wasn't that bad. I mean, <laughs> right. I I think I wore a tie maybe twice mm. the whole whole time I was there. Most of the time I didn't wear shoes. Just would get to my desk, kick them off. You know, I I had to negotiate to at least keep my socks on with the boss lady, and I brought my dog to work. And, you know, would host Art Walk and try to make the best of a meh situation. But, I don't know, it was consistent income with the potential to make more income. But once I realized that I gave zero shits about insurance, I was like, oh yeah, it's hard to be a salesman for something you don't care about. Mm. And I was still doing massage on my own, just... Out like converted a room in the house that I was staying in into a massage room. I would just put up, put my bed up Murphy bed style in the closet. You know, curtains. People didn't even know that I lived in that room until I t- until they asked, <laughs> and I told them. I was like, no, my bed's right right there. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Again, dealing with roommates and. I've been a part of the Burning Man scene in Seattle pretty much since I moved here. Always kind of going to parties, going to potlucks, just meeting all these cool, eclectic people who, you know, they, a lot of them are tech people, work at Microsoft, do whatever, but have this, you know, artistic wild side to them where, you know, they do 
do f- big art projects, have fun parties, listen to way too much EDM, and <laughs> finally last year pulled the trigger and went went down to Burning Man and re- helped build this massive art project with Seaweed Artist Collective, and came back and realized I can't I can't sit at a desk anymore, so. I kind of, yeah, got the hell out of Dodge. Like, I'm sorry, but I don't care about your insurance agency. It's not my passion. Good luck. I'm going to pursue this idea I've had for years. So, went to Idaho, bought an RV, spent three months of, like, 70 to 80-hour weeks just remodeling it and uh, came back to Seattle and now I'm building it back, building it up. Wow. Wow. Man. <laughs> what, what was quitting? What was the leaving? What was the nail in the coffin for the insurance company? It sounded like you said, yeah, you can't sell what you're not passionate about that sort of thing. But what was that nail in the coffin moment at the was nail it at Burn, in the- burning man or, The nail in the coffin for me was, it was a Friday afternoon, and in the year that I'd been working there, Fridays were always just, like, a waste of time, because nobody answered their phone, like, even more so than normally, and the the agency owner had, she'd been in the office maybe 10 hours that entire week. So I felt slightly disgruntled about that, you know, holding down the fort for this thing that isn't even mine. And uh, I was, you know, it was slow. It was like three o'clock and told the, the new admin. It was like, hey, you know what? Let's leave early. You don't tell the boss lady. I won't tell the boss lady. It'll be fine. It doesn't matter. She hasn't even been here for two days so uh i leave you know tell her to lock up get a call 10 minutes later nick can you go back to the office i know it's three o'clock and sunny on a friday (laughs) but i i just really want you to be there just just in case someone calls and i was like you know what no it's like the classic <laughs> office space moment. Yeah. I'm going to need you to come in yeah. on the weekend. Uh, it, was, it was so awesome. <laughs> so awesome <laughs> the way I, I left there. But, you know, burned a bridge. Oh, but... tell, tell me more about that. <laughs> what does that look like? Well, how, how not to quit your job? Is that, can we title it that? <laughs> Or, or how to quit or how your job to. and leave with a big ass grin on your face. Yes. Uh, yeah. She, uh, Juliet, the owner, came in, and you know we had a talk, talk about, you know this is this is my baby. I you know I'm invested in this all this sort of stuff and everything she said. I could hear, what she what I perceive she meant as in I am indebted to this job. I am shackled to this chair, this desk. I have to make these calls and please, will you hang out? Will you help me with this? And no. (laughs) And (laughs) I mean, it was, she got all emotional about it. And, you know, I'm like, Juliet, you know, nothing personal this just isn't my thing you know gave her a big hug i was like good luck i'm gonna do what i'm passionate about thank you for the opportunity beautiful (laughs) middle fingers in the air yeah (laughs) to the listening audience the guest just flipped off the world (laughs) fuck you i'm done with this uh, so yeah, and I don't know, it's been a slow start with the mobile massage thing, but as is any business venture when you start out, but the thing is, I'm 
enjoy talking to people about what I do. I enjoy the the reactions that I get from people. Everyone's super excited and they're like, "Oh wow, that's such a brilliant idea!" I'm like, "I know." Yeah, and we're <laughs> we're sitting in in your creation. Yeah. At the moment, what what is this band called? Uh, this is Drift Mobile Massage Clinic, or Drift, or Big Blue Beast. When I'm driving down narrow Seattle <laughs> streets, and we are in the belly of a blue beast at the moment. Yes, very relaxing. This is lavender. Is that lavender in the sink? Yep. Uh, gonna get some rosemary to grow in here eventually. Uh, I would would really like to put, I don't know, some sort of I was thinking a chia seed lawn on the roof. Just a just, massive chia pet. Yeah. Just, you know, some sort of nice soft plant with a shallow root base that won't ruin my, you know, roof or something. And very healthy. High yeah. in omega three fatty acids and fiber. Sure. Why not? Why not? <laughs> Why not? Wake up, do yoga on the roof. But, uh, yeah, it was uh, definitely a process. And I've been, I've been researching, you know, box trucks, uh, you know, you just cruising Craigslist for years, checking out, you know, prices for, like, the food truck sort of setups that you see. Was this premeditated while you were in the insurance job or oh, even yeah. before that? Oh, looking well, for a way to looking for a van or a truck to convert into a mobile massage clinic. Or... I mean, it's been an idea for a long time. It kind of mm. started when when I was working down in LA at this nice little boutique spa and people would come in, they'd get a great massage, they'd be all zinned out and relaxed and then would have to get on the freeway to go back home and I was like, "Oh man, you're just diminishing my right. my efforts here and you know i i love doing in-home in-office massages where you know especially in-home where you know i pack up my table person can just veg out on the couch fall asleep whatever but there's the issue with that from the therapist side is you know, you pretty much add an hour onto each appointment because you got to drive there, you got to set up, you got to break down. So Drift came about as the happy medium between people driving to a clinic and me going into a person's house. Like, they get the same, you know, relaxed, purpose, purposely built environment for them to get a massage in and they don't have to worry about you know moving their dirty underwear off their couch or <laughs> getting corralling the dogs or what have you and lord knows i've experienced it all <laughs> as, <laughs> as a massage therapist where i'm like huh it's a lot of clowns in here <laughs> weird very weird <laughs> but uh have you so in drift have you driven across the country was there that part of it how how much drifting have you done uh with drift little very very so little far. just mm. because i mean i had intended on being i i totally thought i was going to buy this buy an rv and 2 3 weeks remodel it not a problem but you know like Pretty much every project I've ever worked on, ever, it takes a lot longer than anticipated. So, and, you know, it's a 30-year-old RV. I had to replace whole sections that just had water damage and was completely rotted out. Mm. So, I it was an interesting experience in the fact that I never painted a car before or prepped a car for that i never i've done a lot of like interior painting and remodel sort of work in houses with you know my grandpa my dad my uncle throughout throughout the years but 
kind of combining all of that into something that you know I wanted was a lot of fun. And having rented apartments for years, there's you're you're limited in what you can do because you always got to just repaint it or mm -hmm. lose the deposit. So it was great having that free reign to just paint, you know, whatever color pattern I wanted and, you know, found this awesome batik fabric to put on the roof to give it this extra sort of under under the sea yeah, tropical vibe. It's like inside a blue whale. Yeah. Like Pinocchio on a raft inside a whale. And, you know, random little things. Like I did, made this molding out of uh, oak that was in my dad's barn that I planed and, and uh, you know, routed myself. And, like, the outside of the door in the window frame, it was just, hor like, crappy plastic that was deteriorating from years of being out in the sun and I had this idea of a copper framed window so I took you know plywood wrapped it in uh, un unoxidized or uncoated copper so that eventually it'll get a patina as I'm traveling and going what's a patina uh, old pennies that greenish hue that gotcha. they get. Gotcha. So. And when you and when you're going through this, if you ever ran into a block of something you've not done before and remodeling the interior or with the engine, how did you figure out? Well, like the engine mechanical stuff is not my thing. Where so, I first thing I did was I took it to a shop that my dad trusted and they dialed it in because i mean it's a it's an old rv mm -hmm. granted it i mean it had forty three thousand miles on it which is pretty good for a 30 year old mileage. vehicle <laughs> but you know driving a vehicle very little is almost as bad as driving it way too much mm -hmm. to a degree so fluids and everything had to be changed and i mean i don't think it really been driven much for the past four or five years previously so but that was, and that was the reason that i went for an rv instead of a box truck was just extremely low miles on rvs typically it's already plumbed got the electricity got you know some of the amenities that i knew that i would need as far as cupboards and all that sort of stuff you know after having gone through the process, I'm, I think I'd probably go for a box truck next time just because, you know, clean slate, but you know, this was, uh, got to start somewhere. Right. So, <laughs> and did you, was it mostly DIY then? Oh yeah. Did you use, were there any online resources that you used to figure uh, stuff out or was it just not i mean a lot of it was just ripping things out and <laughs> love it because <laughs> i mean it was all just old crappy 80s shag carpeting that i mean i don't know if you've ever ripped out carpet in any house ever it's disgusting because you just see all the stuff that is fallen on the floor for mm. however many years mm. so but yeah i mean i like i said i'd done like remodels of houses before and like teardowns of houses so i knew a lot of stuff but i definitely noticed while i was going through the process and you know instagram instagramming my my process and i would just find you know rv remodel diy rv remodel hashtags and just there's like this whole community of people that i realized are doing similar things maybe not i mean not 
the massage thing as much, but definitely people just saying, you know what, we've done the the house thing, the you know the mortgage, the four cars, the bills, and the soccer practices and all that, and we're picking up and we're traveling around the country for a little bit, and. Yeah, so back to your original question, I've pretty much driven from southern Idaho to here in Seattle and have just been more focusing on building my client base up here with the eventual intention of you know, going to different festivals, races, that sort of stuff around the Pacific Northwest. So drifting to to be determined right now right but you have the sail up <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. what what advice would you give to someone living in a van is sort of this like mysterious lifestyle that a lot of people really want it seems like it's oh living in a van there's a lot of websites dedicated to van living yeah. Especially in Pacific Northwest, we see Vanual a lot of it. Is a new Vanual. one that I just heard about. What advice would you give to someone who feels stuck in their insurance S job and wants to, and maybe dreams of getting their own drift on? Uh, I mean, it's definitely going to be an adjustment. I mean, I've, like I said, I've done this sort of thing before in much much worse ways. I mean, when I was living out of the back of my truck, I had a sleeping mat and a sleeping bag in the back of my truck and my charm. <laughs> Your charm. Well, cuz I was dating, you know, would oh, I see. be dating a girl and, you know, spend a lot of time over at her place or something. Mm. But uh yeah, I don't know. It's it's definitely unique and especially with an RV and the stigma, especially in Seattle around RVs, it's tricky. Granted, my RV uh, looks really nice compared to most of Certainly. the other ones around around town. And I mean, I specifically leave all the windows open mm. so that people can walk walk by, and you know, I have my my logo and signs up and in, in the windows because I don't want there to be any any mystery to it. I don't want people to think I'm cooking meth in here or sure. whatever, which I think Breaking Bad definitely did a great <laughs> disservice to RV living because <laughs> Lord knows I got a lot of lot of flack from my friends about, about that. I was like, oh, yeah, a little extracurriculars in there. I was like, no. Have you had any customers come up looking for something other than a massage? No, definitely. <laughs> I mean, there was one night that I was over on Alki and just some like random drunk, drugged out people were walking by and knocked on the door and, do you have a blanket? Do you have a can of soup? I'm like, no, I don't. Go away. Blanket, that's a, that's a hot commodity. On the street, I when I was sleeping in Waikiki, I was sleeping on the sidewalk. Yeah, and, and well, I don't know if I was really sleeping, but mm -hmm. laying on the sidewalk trying to sleep. Yeah, more than once we were pestered for a blanket, and we were using towels. So we had yeah. people come up and offer twenty five or thirty cents for our, for our towels. Anyway, really? Yeah, just and one single person. Can, I'll give you 30 cents for that towel. I'm just thinking... Did you just laugh at him? No, I'm not going to give you my towel. It's yeah. my blanket. Yeah. Well, uh, and, but I, I mean, can totally understand. I mean, you got to have a blanket. Yeah, <laughs> but you also... I mean, one of, one of the things that I really like about Burning Man, there's the 10 principles, and I forget what all of them are, but one of them is radical self-reliance. And I've grown up mm. hiking, hunting, fishing living in the outdoors and you know it was just drilled in my head from early on that if you're going out anywhere you prepare as if the worst scenario is going to happen and granted I don't do that all the time bring in a space blanket and 
you know, flares and a satellite phone and, you know, all the things that you could do. But, I mean, when this guy asked me, I was like, dude, get get your shit together. There are plenty of resources, especially in Seattle, that will help you out with this sort of stuff. And I'm not it. <laughs> but that's that seems to be a big point for you, the radical self-reliance. Yeah. For someone who, if I think back to the corporate space or anyone, people who are stuck in whatever that pattern and in a job and a lot of those comforts like the mortgage and mm-hmm. the house and but the it's, car. And, you know, people think of that stuff as secure, but it's not. Right. I mean, I think anyone who was working in, you know, a service industry or construction or like so many uh, types of work in 2008 will tell you for certain that all of those creature comforts are not secure because, you know, whatever dividends and stock markets crashing will just have a domino effect. Mm. And, you know, my, for me, I was working at this really nice ski resort in central Idaho, but because of mismanagement of finances by the CEO, uh, people buying these investment properties from, you know, all around the world and not, and, or not factoring in the fact that people might not actually rent their $400 a day chalet condo and then like going bankrupt on their house. And, you know, eventually my, my, the whole resort went bankrupt and I was like, yeah, I could stay here and, you know, do massage at this other, this other spa that I work at and cook at this restaurant or I would try big city living again. So yeah, I mean, I, I keep thinking about, especially Seattle with the tech boom and, you know, the entire city has changed drastically in the seven years that I've lived here. I mm-hmm. mean, Mm-hmm. whole sections of town that were just super industrial and ghetto and gritty are now high rise office towers of people just you know yeah south lake union yeah with amazon is 60 80 hours a week and i mean those are a lot of my clients and yeah they make a lot of money a lot more than i do for sure but you know, just from the tension that I like regularly have to work out mm-hmm. of their bodies and the stress that they carry, it is not an enviable lifestyle for me. And I mean, I was a computer science major when I started college, but after the first semester, I just decided that that is not how I wanted to spend my life. What was it about the computer science? Was it the sitting? or the reliance on sitting in front of a screen so much that sort of turned you away or was it something else or um yeah def- all of it <laughs> all, all of it uh it just didn't seem real to me hmm. i mean i there was definitely the kind of a matrix like moment where hmm. you know i was doing a program for a test or a class and just the thought that you know what if uh what if there's a big supernova or like a big solar flare or something? All these computers are just going to be paperweights in an instant. So, you know, then I went to, I switched majors to business. After graduating college, I moved to LA for a job and it was just corporate monkey, you know, walk in the door, turn off my brain. <laughs> do the things, get off work, party, 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 pass out, wake up, do it again. And the cycle, it was fun. Yeah. LA in your early twenties is a hell of a place to be for sure. But after, (laughs) after a year or so of that, I just was pretty unfulfilled. I mean, I had a nice wardrobe 
you know, from all the finest Goodwills in Los <laughs> Angeles. <laughs> and uh, I had a vast assortment of, of stylish ties that I hated wearing, but, <laughs> you know, oh, this is a nice paisley print, so that's that's cool. <laughs> and, yeah, I had been doing massage for years just as a hobby and just a thing that people told me I was good at and finally found a massage school that really vibed with me and uh, you know when I because when I was backpacking through Europe and I know I'm like zigzagging through my history so much but uh, I was in Florence Italy I had uh, hitchhiked all over Germany, Austria, and had hopped on the train to. Uh, I was supposed to go to Venice, but I fell asleep. I just had way too many beers at the Hofbrau House in Munich. Nice. And when you say you hopped on the train, did you have a ticket and you were inside I did a have train, a or were you on a ticket. freight train? I did. Have, <laughs> just to be clear, I'm not that. We're, we're hitchhiking, and then on the train. Yeah. Okay. No, okay. I, I bought... An actual passenger on a on a train. Yes. Okay. But uh drank too many beers, slept through the stop to Venice, ended up in Florence, which hey, you know, that's not too bad either. <laughs> but I was so broke, so broke at this point in my trip. I was just counting my dollars and knew that I just had to get back to Madrid and then I could be a bum on in the streets of Madrid until I caught my flight back t- to America. You had your return flight already booked. Yeah, because I mean it was I was just leave just gone for the summer. Gotcha. So I had you know. And when you're a bum days. on the streets of Madrid, are you are you sleeping on the streets of Madrid? There were a couple times. Yeah. Yeah. Which I don't know. It was summer in Spain. It was fine. How did you uh, How did you determine finding your sleeping spot? <laughs> just, I. When I first got into Madrid, I had uh, th- I had checked out some hostels that were dirt cheap, but I got there and they were totally booked up. Mm-hmm. So I'm wandering around, and eventually I just found a stairwell, and I just slept in that, and I was out of the rain. <laughs> it was a freak, like thunderstorm that was just. Raining cats and dogs, but yeah, I mean, in Florence, I was just super broke, been backpacking around on cobblestone streets. My my dogs were barking, so I was giving myself a little foot massage, and this cute French-Canadian girl was like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, well, you know, massage is kind of a hobby of mine, so giving my legs a little massage, and she's like, oh, can you give me a massage? And Gave her a little neck and shoulder massage, and she was just all blissed out. And I told her, oh, yeah, I'm probably leaving tomorrow to go up north to Milan and Cinque Terre. And she's like, no, my friends and I are kidnapping you, and you're riding north with us. I'm like, okay, pretty girl, whatever. <laughs> and it was it was that moment that I realized I I can work anywhere I got my hands basically and you know have wow. a tangible effect on people right then and there wow so self-reliance relying on your own hands yeah yeah for sure and i mean i've given massages to you know elder tribes women in like the mountains outside of chiang rai thailand and you know, just random, random places. And it's a great way to just help people out and be like, no, let me, you know, stretch, stretch things out mm. for you. And mm. yeah. And, and there's scientific studies showing that 15 minutes of massage, chair massage, Thai massage, whatever increases, uh, like immune system response decreases work-related stress and act like people have higher mental acuity and can do better on Mm. math solving formulas and stuff so 
you know, research is out there. And mm. honestly, we've been massaging each other since we were monkeys picking nicks sure. out of each other's hair. So, <laughs> science, science or not, I can say from personal experience, I a Thai massage I had on Koh Tao, Thailand, one one hour Koh session Tao. from a man who called himself Grandmaster, Grandmaster mm. Samsak. Flash. Grandmaster of Pain. <laughs> he walked on my calves and walked on my back and stepped on my stomach. I didn't even realize you could massage a stomach until that oh, yeah. point. But one hour with him did more for me than one month of physical therapy. Oh yeah. And I canceled all my plans and just stayed there for an extra week. Oh nice. To exclusively get massaged by Grandmaster of Pain. And <laughs> you're suck. you're probably also doing the scuba training there. Definitely. Right? Yeah. My daily schedule was wake up, see Grandmaster Pain, and then scuba dive, and then go to sleep, wake up Grandmaster, <laughs> scuba dive. And I did that for a week. He looked at me, he said, Oh, five days, eighty percent. It's like, you need five days to get me to 80%. I can't even imagine. After that fifth day, I was like, right, this is where I'm staying. After that fifth day, I felt like I could stand properly, mm -hmm. breathe properly. Mm -hmm. Just felt like I felt elevated in every sense. Yeah. But, so I'd, I'd like to track back to, I like this radical self radical self-reliance. And you mentioned that you have... You, you maybe carried too much with you when you were in Europe or you oh, had yeah. a, you, so if you could go back and sort of if you had to have this bug out bag as they're called or if you had a backpack mm -hmm. what are some of the essential items so you've got your hands mm -hmm. which just sounds like a very essential item yeah what would you have in your backpack uh, so the bare uh, minimum essentials for your your bug out or your travel bag uh, so a hori hori it's a Japanese gardening tool, which is it's like a, sp a spade, super heavy-duty blade. One side is serrated. Uh, it comes to a point. It's got a, a – I, I wonder where I have it. Oh, probably, worry, worry. Okay. Probably in my camping bag or something. But a hammock and, you know, the rope that you need to hang it from whatever – Uh, I don't know. Trail mix, <laughs> water filter, uh, Camelback. I mean, yeah, it's like I I've never never really carried around a a compass or anything. I've always I mean I grew up with like an open sky, so I. And always into constellations and stuff, so I've always been able to know just where North was wow. from looking at the North Star so and just everything. Read the sky, yeah, which was really confusing when I went to South Africa because it was like opposite. I've never seen almost all of these stars. <laughs> Orion's still down there; it's in a different spot in the sky, mm -hmm. but um, probably a mirror to you know make sure that you look presentable and there's always the signaling idea with it uh fingernail clippers for being a massage therapist and uh coconut oil coconut oil yeah what would you use coconut oil for i mean you can use it for anything massage obviously it's uh, good for sunscreen you can eat it you can butter your toast with it um you know Good, I, yeah. Coconut oil is just good all around for everything. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah, I drink it sometimes. Oh yeah, like, Co in coffee, in tea. Have you ever done a coconut oil gargle? No, I've tried the oil pulling. Yes, just holding it in the too. mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not tried the gargle. Yeah, I mean, if you have a sore throat, <laughs> oh, I you know I tried this actually before a talk last week mm -hmm. i was talking too much before it my throat was getting sore so i just i sort of i didn't gargle but i i just drank some coconut oil oh, no, to I've move up the vocal that, cords i've done that when i'm in a massage and i i'll have a tickle <laughs> in my throat i'll just take my my oil bottle and like drip it into my mouth 
oh, coat my throat. It's so nice. And in fact, the hori hori, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is that something that you can bring on an airplane? Uh, not carry on. Not carry for on. Sure. All right. Oh, it's this is a bag we're checking. Oh, I see. Are we talking a foot long or uh, eight inches probably. Right. I'll find it online. Full tank I'm blade. Not, this sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And I don't know, uh, probably a notebook if I didn't didn't have technology and a cell phone just for journaling. And pen and paper. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing better than writing. It, it, typing has a feeling, but pen to paper is just the stream of thought to paper. There's something therapeutic about that. Oh, yeah. Definitely. rv i've had some people that are like what's this rv doing in my neighborhood <laughs> and then i give them a business card and say hey book a mas- book a massage hey, i'll give you a discount i provide bliss and i'm in your yeah. neighborhood <laughs> yeah. you can walk down the street and get a massage how awesome is that uh always be open to opportunities for sure mm. i'm a big fan of yes and just going with it of saying yes yes yeah (laughs) saying yes trying out new things Mm. and uh last uh, you can sleep when you die word yeah in a comfortable casket or as a in a compostable yeah. grave and become a tree for someone who's listening and is at their desk and is wearing the tie that person what was this 10 years ago or 15 years ago what advice would you give to the person who's behind their desk to wear this lifestyle is just a dream and a far a far off fantasy land for them uh, it's a lot easier to attain than you would think Get rid of your stuff because, you know, there's no roof rack on the hearse. Another saying that I live by. And, you know. There's no roof rack on the hearse? Yeah, you know, you can't take it with you. Mm. Mm. You know, I would much rather That's spend great. my money on good food, good, good cocktails, and, you know, memories than stuff. Granted, I'm... I do have a bit of a comic book obsession that I've been slowly weaning myself off of. But, you know, we all have our vices. Sure. So know what yours is and start shedding. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, you know, especially living in a place like Seattle, why do I need a big screen TV if I could go to the Cinerama or, you know, God forbid, hike up to a mountain peak and be like, oh, world, 360 panorama. I guess I don't need to buy those new Oculus VR goggles. Right, right. Go out and have the experience yourself rather than collect things to have an experience Yeah. at home in place of having the real experience yeah now, that will be a tricky space as vr becomes more popular eh? i actually was uh set up at the volunteer park pride festival last weekend and uh who was it one i don't know facebook or T- samsung had a booth set mm-hmm. up and they had their vr glasses and it was an amazing experience mm-hmm. for sure you know, the first scene, you're on a boat, a long boat in Southeast Asia, paddling through a river. You know, another one, you're traveling through space. Another one, you're kind of in the middle of a Cirque du Soleil performance. And, you know, another one, there's dinosaurs around you. And it was all really, really legit seeming, but yeah. It was interesting, but I would rather actually, you know, spend the comparably, I think it was uh, 
nine hundred dollars for this setup. It's like, man, I could buy a flight to Phnom Penh for that, and then for five dollars a day, eat the best damn Southeast Asian food ever. So, right, that always the the fear of the travel price tag. It's always an interesting thing. So you can get this VR experience. How much does the TV cost? How much do the VR goggles cost? How much does your car payment, what's your car payment running you so that you can continue to live your comfortable office life mm-hmm. versus how much is it? How much does it really cost? In your case, you're backpacking Europe on a shoestring if you even had any shoestrings. Yeah, God. I mean, I... Well, I went over there with the intention of going to school in one place for the entire three months. And after the first couple of days, I was like, screw this. Mm. Did one month of school, traveled the rest of the time, had such a better time. Mm. I mean, it was, northern Spain was beautiful, and it would have been a great place to hang out for a while, but not when the rest of Europe was so easily attainable. Someone, say someone who has never traveled before, mm-hmm. what would you tell them to do other than go travel? Because I think we can get lost in planning and Not I get me. a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I get a lot of questions. I just do of, it. People are then... three months out and want to plan out every single day. Uh, I mean, I think having a, a rough itinerary of places you want to go is great. A milestone chart. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, for me, when I was in Europe, it was meeting up with the exchange students that were that I went to high school with mm-hmm. that were in... Well, and I had some college friends you know, also studying abroad. Mm. So, yeah, I that was kind of what dictated some of my travel, but then... As I would meet other people, they'd tell me about, oh, you should go to this week-long music festival in Budapest that's on an island in the Danube. And I was like, okay, sweet. My This was a, a, a exchange student girl that I had such a huge crush on in, in high school, and we were like senior prom dates and everything, but... We never even saw each other at the festival because there's thousands of people there. But at the train station in Prague, I met this group of kids from Paris, and I ended up camping with them the entire week. And then I was, you know, in a uh, like a Turkish style bathhouse that was 500 <laughs> years old, and you know, women had it was. Women hadn't stepped foot onto the men's side in the entire history of this place. It was really interesting, and I'm pretty sure this this guy was trying to hit on me, but I'm super naive, and I was like, so yeah, that buy a... me dinner. So I you did care. say yes. I did say yes, and I had an All I'm amazing, hearing is always say yes. I had an amazing meal at this five-star Budapest restaurant that this guy took me to, and... Uh, I don't know. He didn't. He didn't proposition me, and I didn't <laughs> uh, feel creeped out at all. And you know, left Budapest the next morning with a full belly of, of just amazing food. Mm. And uh, yeah, I had a few times where I was just so naive at the time. It's so it's funny looking back at just how. How much of a, a little country boy I used to be. And, I mean, I think to a, to a degree I still am. I still have this slight bit of uh, naivete and wonder when I look at things. And, you know, just being able to go to a place with no expectations and being able to experience it. Uh, yeah. You know, without preconceived notions is really cool. Mm. Mm. And, yeah, I think do it do it now before 
Walmart and McDonald's and Starbucks takes over the world. <laughs> like I want to go to Cuba real bad because you know cruise ships are starting to go in there. Uh, I think U.S. Airways just said that they're starting to fly yeah. in there. There's ferries from Florida to Cuba mm-hmm. that are beginning to operate as well, or plans to to operate. Yeah. So, and. I don't know. I really want to do a Central and South America tour of countries that hate America. (laughs) Colombia, Venezuela, all of these places that, you know, all of the the press they get in America is just drug czars and horrible war zones. But, you know, probably the best places to visit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the most untouched. Go to South Central LA and you'll see a war zone. <laughs> you'll see some disparity to match even the worst slums in Johannesburg. So, I don't know. Danger looks lurks all around. Right. But, I don't know. Nothing sounds more dangerous to me than just dying in your your rocking chair. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Or and your swivel, your swivel ergonomic office chair. Yeah. Well, and I don't know about your grandparents, but, or parents, but like they never traveled growing up or, you know, when they were in their twenties, their thirties, they were raising families because that's what you did. Yeah. And, you know, now that my grandparents are retired and, you know, they're traveling around some, but they can't do... They they can go to the Grand Canyon, go up to the edge and look down, but they can't raft down it. They can't mountain bike down into the depths of it. That's the sort of stuff I want to do now. Mm. And, you know, I long wanted to go out in a fiery crash of some sort, but... I don't know. Then I got a dog. and really, <laughs> Right on, man. I really like my dog. <laughs> I wouldn't want her to be sad without me. What, uh, what, what would you say is the biggest lesson that you learned in your travels? Or a lesson that you've learned and you carry with you? Uh, less is more. Less is more. Yeah. Be, I mean... Your backpack answer was great because it... You stopped at three items and then had to sort of <laughs> think through if well, there was anything I else mean, you'd need. You can always just buy it somewhere. Yeah. Or, you know, in my situation, I can easily barter people goods for services. Just, you know, offer them a massage and get a meal for it. And But, yeah, like when I went mm. to Europe, I had packed... Like, I was going to be living in one apartment for three months. And it was horrible for the two months that I was backpacking with all my stuff. So, yeah. And then, you know, going to Southeast Asia, there's no reason to buy, to bring clothes. Because you can buy super cheap clothes over there. And I kind of wish that I had... At the time, it would have been nice to have got, you know, a tailored suit while I was there for next to nothing. And But, you know, I'm fine that I paid to go to massage school instead of buy a suit or something. Mm-hmm. It's much more useful because I just, I just gave away or took all of my ties to Goodwill. Mm-hmm. I had, I don't know, a hundred ties that I hadn't worn in years and I had had these ideas of sewing them into a costume that I'd wear at (laughs) Burning Man or something where it's like a kilt or something made out of ties. And then I was like, ah, I don't give a shit. (laughs) I want to get rid of this stuff. I don't need it. I'm probably not going to do this project, you know, anytime soon. There are plenty of ties at Goodwills that I can find another time. Right. Sweet. Yeah. Less is more. Find a way to use your hands. Mm-hmm. 
awesome man thank you yeah thank you timo <laughs> all right Nick, thanks for inviting me into your home yeah the You're mobile welcome. awesomeness yeah and if and if people want to find you on the internet where can they find you uh driftmobilemassage.com uh you can book online i do primarily deep tissue sports Thai massage and cupping and more often than not it's kind of a fusion of of all of them sweet driftmobilemassage.com and then you have an instagram handle as well right uh, i think it's drift mobile massage as well drift mobile massage yeah sweet so you can follow my random adventures yep mostly it's pictures of my dog in different <laughs> locations so great man yeah all right thanks a lot thank you and that concludes this session of The Way In with Nick Easterday. For show notes and to connect with Nick, get a massage, check out his van and this awesome lifestyle he's leading, head over to timoway.com slash 003 and we'll get you connected. And before you head off, how can you go into the world and meet people with a more open mind? How can you use that beautiful smile of yours to maybe open up a few more doors? What new opportunities can you open up by just saying yes to a few more things? And we're not talking about saying yes to that new TV or that new purse. Remember, there's no roof rack on the hearst.